gear. Just how good is Ford's new Mondeo? How good is its predecessor as a second-hand buy? And talking of Sierras, off-road in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Greetings and welcome to a new series of Top Gear, which begins with a program that is largely given over to Ford. Thanks very much. Ford, you see, is as much a part of the way of life in Britain as the royal family, or drizzle, or even fish and chips. If the BBC is your auntie, then Ford is your uncle. So, when Ford launches a new car, it's big news. But when Ford launches a replacement for the Sierra, well, you drop everything. Except your fish and chips, of course. This is the car in question, the new Mondeo. Later in the programme, I'm going to be road testing it, but whether it turns out to be a good car or not is largely academic, because it will sell. It will sell because there are hundreds of dealers and because Fords are easy to insure, easy to mend and easy to own. But more than that, it will sell because of its family tree. Michelle Newman starts the ball rolling by looking at its granddad. Or perhaps, Jeremy, great-great-great-granddad. For it was no less than five car generations ago, in 1962, that Ford revolutionised the family car market with this. At the time, British family saloons were named after Tweedy University towns. They were oh so respectable in appearance and cost a substantial slice of the average family budget. But Ford changed all that. We're at Cortina, Italy, famed as a winter sports resort, where 19 world champion race and rally drivers are being fated for having accumulated more than 200 wins in 26 countries driving the Ford Cortina, named the International Car of the Year. When the world's finest drivers get together, something exciting is bound to happen. And in this case, it's the discovery of an exciting new sport called auto bobbing. Here's what the famed bobsled run looks like from the driver's seat of the world famous Cortina. Championship sleds travel the course at about 50 miles per hour. And the Cortina exceeds that speed while taking some of the turns with only six inches of clearance. Former world champion Jim Clark says it's the most exciting sport he's ever tackled. We'll take his word for it. But if you have any doubts, he recommends a Cortina, lots of nerve, and plane tickets to Italy for you and your doctor. By using the Cortina name, Ford gave their new car the aura of ski resorts, glamour, and pizzazz. By keeping it simple, they kept the price down to little more than the tiny but technically advanced Mini, and left room for a healthy profit margin to boot. It was a marketing coup that changed the way Britain thought about family cars forever. And it wasn't just a new name. For car buyers on a budget, the Cortina was full of tempting detail, like the horizontal speedo and the aluminium dashboard. This was avant-garde, 1960s style. Outside, there are enough sharp edges to give you the impression that it was designed by Gillette. In fact, the only things that weren't sharp were these Van the Bomb rear lights. Well, it didn't take long for Ford's marketeers to realize they were really onto something. So, four years and a million Cortinas later, they launched another. Although rather more sober in appearance, the Mark II Cortina took Ford's business panache a stage further. They realized that one car, they could appeal to everybody. And so they became masters at selling the same basic body in lots of different versions. Starting with the Deluxe, those on a shoestring, through to the Super, the GT, and to this, the XR3i of its day, the 1600E. E, of course, was very executive, elevated by these wooden door fillets, matching dashboard, the plethora of gauges, and this leather encased steering wheel. The Cortina had at last become a class motor. The executive also got lowered ground-hugging suspension, matte black trim and row-style wheels, all hinting at a fairly brisk turn of speed. Of course, cars went out of date pretty quickly back then, so 1970 brought another Cortina. Only this time, Ford got a bit cocky.
It's refinement that gives a look of prestige to the new Cortina. Refinement in style and in the hidden qualities of the engineering. She doesn't care that the seats have been ergonomically designed with extra leg room in the front. She just knows she's comfortable. She doesn't care that the wider track and new suspension have been designed to improve the handling and reduce vibration. She only knows it's a really smooth, sophisticated ride. She doesn't know that the bulkhead has been specially soundproofed and that the wiper motor and blower have been banished to the engine compartment. She only knows it's easier to hear the nice things he says in the new Cortina. Thankfully, they don't make commercials like that anymore. But with their car, Ford's marketing team have got it right again. The radical style hit the mood of the 70s and shot the Cortina to the number one slot in the sales charts for month after month after month. There's no doubting what decade you're in here with the jumbo-sized Fablon dash, the sticky black plastic seats and the instruments buried down by your ankles. You keep expecting James Burke to be alongside. Slip something stirring in the 8-track and you're ready for tomorrow's world. With the Mark IV, Ford were pandering to the fleet markets they'd helped to create. It was a conventional car, but then it had to be. If it was to sell to the reps that Ford now knew so well, better in fact than anyone else in the business. They were enormously successful at it. By 1981, in every eight cars sold in Britain was a Cortina. It wasn't the best car you could own, even if it was a V6 gear like this one. But with 20 years marketing expertise behind them, Ford could do no wrong. They were crushing the opposition like Beatles. And it didn't stop there. They kept the pace up. Shortly after the four millionth Cortina came off the production line, Ford decided it was time for a major change. Only this time, they well and truly blew it. In 1982, Ford launched the slippery-shaped Sierra and made a mistake that was to cost them millions. They pitched a very modern car at a very old-fashioned and deeply conservative market. The smart set wouldn't drive it because it was a Ford, and Ford fanciers hated it because it didn't look like a Ford. The Sierra was Uncle Henry's worst marketing muck-up since the end. Initial sales slumped because it was a car that was too ahead of its time. In fact, the radical new Ford was actually very good. By 1985, those contentious jelly mold lines had become a familiar sight and were widely accepted. In my time, I must have bought and sold literally hundreds of Sierras and reckon they're one of the most dependable and reliable family cars you can buy today. They're simple, sturdy and cheap to fix and capable of racking up extraordinarily high mileages without demur. But don't take my word for it. As a fleet manager, I have responsibility for a fleet of something in the region of 1,000 business cars, um, at which something in the region of 200 uh, were Sierras. Um, this Sierra has always performed well. Um, there's never been any major problems with it. Um, it's been relatively inexpensive to buy, the residual values have been good, and its operating costs have been um, what one has expected and, and well up to par. There are plenty of them around, there's plenty to choose from, and obviously one needs to uh, choose a Sierra with care because many of them can be a very high mileage car. Um, but there are a lot of four dealerships around, so parts aren't a problem, and um, there's always a ready market when one comes to trade on. So what goes wrong? Well, precious little actually. If you avoid the very early cars up to 1985 and go for the post-86 models that have had a facelift, there's very little to leave you stranded on the hard shoulder with the bonnet up. The great thing about the Sierra is that it has all the mechanical simplicity of a knife and fork. Regular maintenance, 
100,000 miles is certainly not unexpected. 150,000 miles is very possible. Indeed, we have a vehicle here that we service at regular intervals and is currently 150,000 just over, in fact. And the best news is they're so straightforward they can be serviced anywhere. At this fast fit centre, they'll fit a new radiator for 60 pounds, a new exhaust for 98, replace a pair of shock absorbers for 55 quid, and change your oil and filter for just 14 pounds. Does that sound cheap enough for you? There are far more Sierra models than there ever were Cortinas, and these are some of the best. An uptown carryall, the very capacious two-liter I gear estate, makes a real load lugger. You've got your trendy roof rails, your alloy wheels, headlamp wash white, electric windows, central locking, everything bristling with all the appurtenances of gracious living. There's also the very sure-footed 4x4 with its gusty 2.9-litre V6 engine. Interestingly enough, the police say that the 4x4 was one of the best motorway patrol cars they've ever had in service. But if you don't want a hatchback, you've also got the choice of a much more happily proportioned Sapphire, which is effectively just a Sierra with a boot. Secondhand, they're worth probably 200 quid less than the hatches. But my best buy has to be the good old 1.8 LX. It'll clip along at 70 miles an hour all day and return 30 miles to the gallon. The models to go for are made after 1990 with these darkened tail lights and you can buy a decent G-plater for around 3,500. They are the most reliable, the best made, and you get the most equipment for your money. And it's all of these virtues which made one motoring magazine called the 1.8 LX Sierra used car of the year. So not only is the Sierra tough, dependable, and can be run on a shoestring, it's relatively cheap to buy too. Take this 92 1.8 LX J-plate car done 14,000 miles, a touch under £7,000, and this is a nearly new car. Or you can go to the other extreme and buy an eight-year-old C or D-plate car for less than two grand. And if you buy privately, you can pick them up for even less. If you went out tomorrow, you could come back with a very presentable car with a long MOT for less than a thousand pounds. So there literally is a Sierra for everybody. The Sierra may be as exciting as a chartered accountant Saturday night out, but it is that rare beast, a used car without vices. And I, for one, shall mourn its passing. <laughs>